So yeah, uh, we are here today to talk about evangelism um, and outreach. I put a class on the Mac catalog that I called a millennial on postmodern evangelism. So I'm a millennial. Um, I kind of, I come from that perspective. That's my, um, that's, that's my bread and butter and, and just the, the culture that I come from, the way I approach the world. I um, started high school the year after the Columbine massacre. So that's, mm -hmm. I think, a really defining um, element of millennial life and culture. Um, I was in eighth grade when Columbine happened. And so it was the discussion about school shootings and metal detectors that was predominant uh, when I began. And then during high school was the 9-11 terror attacks. Um, so millennials are digital natives, but internet newcomers. We, we span that gap. Um, we haven't had the internet our whole lives, but we have had computers our whole lives. Um, and so we, we learned to type in things. And so we've kind of jumped onto the internet a little faster, but often, often in discussions, we get confused with uh, Gen Z, the, the generation that came after us, uh, that is the internet natives. Um, and they're the, the kids these days. When you talk about the young whippersnappers, you know, still living with their parents, um, college kids, those are, those are not millennials anymore. Millennials are 40. The oldest millennials are middle-aged. Um, <laughs> they've turned 40. Um, and the youngest millennials have already graduated grad school time. Uh, so it's, um, it, it, it's just a unique age group. And I think it's an age group people like to talk a lot about. So I kind of um, bring that forward. And, and one thing that's unique about our age group is this idea of postmodernism. Um, that increasingly the world we're living in is a postmodern world. Have you got a question back there? Go ahead, talk to us. Oh, but you got to unmute. <laughs> no. Hmm? No question, no, just no, stretching? No, I wasn't. That's fair. Yeah, I like stretching, stretching too. We're okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, postmodern is a fun word. Everybody likes to use it. Nobody really knows what it means. And that's pretty appropriate for postmodernism. Um, because it's about truthiness. It's about stuff that kind of is, is and kind of isn't, and it's flowy, and things aren't so concrete. It's, it's, it, things aren't so black and white. Um, increasingly, we're finding out that the world is complicated, and issues are complex, and there are perspectives to things. So I kind of want to bring that perspective to a discussion about evangelism. Uh, and I, my hope is that y'all won't let me talk for too long, that we'll kind of start and then we'll generate discussion and we'll, we'll have a good back and forth because that's going to be just a lot more interesting. Um, do I have any initial comments? And if not, I'll, I'll kind of give you some bait to start with. No initial comments. All right. So here's what I want to do. I want to kind of share my screen here. Um, and we'll do this and also this. Okay, can y'all see that? See my handy visual aids? Yes. Yeah, I, have yeah, yeah, I, can see, I can see it. So, so this is the like base philosophy, understanding of evangelism that I was taught when I was young. This is what was passed down to me. Um, the, the definition of evangelism, when we talk about, hey, our church needs to evangelize, what we're talking about is reaching out to these people who are lost, who are unsaved, who are unchristian. We got a William. Come on in, William. Mac. <laughs> we, uh, we call him Mac? Yes. Okay. Um, and let's, uh, let's make sure we ask him to start video so we can see him. Um, okay. Hang on just a second. Oh, sure. Take your time. We'll, we'll give you. Oh, there you are. Howdy. Oh, good. I can't see myself, but I see you. <laughs> well, I, that works. Can you see my screen? Just a second. Is it say evangelism with a little arrow? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, so so this sorry is I'm the, late. I I just got back from a shopping trip. <laughs> we're we're excited to have you. Thank you. I'm Mac, by the way. Good to meet you, Mac. I'm Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Um, so yeah, we, we just started, and, and this is kind of, I, I think this is the base model. This is what I, what I started with. 
um, when I was young, I was kind of told, okay, so evangelism is a matter of taking the lost people, the wrong people, the people that are in the dark, don't know the truth, and bringing them into the light and, and sharing the truth with them. And then they will have the truth and they will transition from dark to light, from uh, lost to found, from blind to sighted. Um, and it'll be this, you know, this, this big important moment for them. Uh, I, it, does that sound familiar to anybody? Is that kind of the model um, that, that we yeah. think about or envision? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. That, that's kind of what we were always taught. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, I, this, is, this is my postmodernist here. I don't want to say this is wrong. I, I think that, you know, we can relate to this idea. There's, there's some truth here, but I think we can probably do better. I think when we look at the complicated experience of evangelism and, and our lives, there's probably a better model. And so uh, I, I, here, here's what that kind of becomes. If you look at that model more closely and you, and you try to do some evangelism in that model, you try to like actually do what your pastor says and share the gospel with these, these lost black side of the screen people. Um, most of the time you spend with non-Christian people does not result in them wanting to suddenly become Christians, right? Is, is that anybody else's experience? Like, so True. Much. Yes. <laughs> um, and then you come back and you say to your pastor, well, I spent time with them and they didn't become a Christian. So I, I guess I wasted my time. And, and your pastor probably says, well, that's okay. Cause you were, you were planting seeds. You know, you might not have been doing evangelism, but you were planting seeds and you never know somebody else could come and water those seeds and they could grow. And then we could have this magic light switch moment. Um, and on the other side of the equation, if you talk to anybody who's like already identified as a Christian, already filled out the census form that says, I'm a Christian, well, then you're not doing evangelism anymore because you're preaching to the choir. So, so this model, the problem with the model is it results in us kind of talking to only the almost Christians and making them into what I call barely Christians. <laughs> it, it makes us most interested only in talking to the people who are like, I don't know if I'm a Christian or not, but who is this Jesus person? And then you say, oh, he's God. And then they say, oh, he's God. Well, thank you. I'm a Christian now. And then you say, sweet, I get a point. I have evangelized. Um, which is just not exciting or interesting. It's just not the best part of evangelism to me <laughs> um, it's it, you know it, it limits the scope it makes that arrow so small and it it makes me feel a little scuzzy and it doesn't help the church much because we're not getting like new followers of christ who are leading and serving we're getting these barely christians who believe something but don't <clears> do <throat> anything about it yet so again i think we can do better still so what if we did something like this this is a more, I think, modern model where evangelism is everything we do to help bring people closer and closer to Christianity. And, and it's not planting seeds to have a conversation with someone who says, hey, um, I always thought Christians were dumb, but I think you're really smart. Um, mm -hmm. That's a step, right? You're, you're dimming on the light. It's more of a dimmer switch. And you get to this place where there's this important conversion moment, and maybe there's a big switch. Um, you decide to commit your life to Christ. Um, Christ moves in you. And then everything after that, we've got this discipleship, and that's still a dimming. That's still a, you know, all of us have portions of ourselves that need more truth, that need more gospel, that need more of Jesus. And so we're always getting closer and closer to something that's beyond us, that's more mature than us, that's more true than us. But we, we have more than they do. And so we can help other people along into evangelism and discipleship. But we can do one better than that. I think we can postmodernize even more, hit you with this. What if it was all one thing? What if there was no difference? And what if, certainly there are people who are wrong, and certainly there are people who are, uh, certainly there is something that is right, right? Jesus is right. Um, and we are all, all of us together, sojourners, on a path of greater knowledge of God, greater faith, greater Christian maturity, and that process is called evangelism and discipleship. It's just, they're just the same thing, 
and somewhere along the path, yeah, there might be like a moment where uh, I, if I died today, I would have gone to hell, but if I die tomorrow, I'll go to heaven. But I don't know when that moment is. Like, I, that's above my pay grade. That's not my job. What my job is, is just to share as much truth as I can with as many people as I can and to gain as much truth as I can from as many people as I can. Because everybody, all of you, have parts of the truth I don't have. Mm -hmm. And I have parts of the truth you don't have. And so my hope today is to evangelize y'all in some ways. Um, not that I think you're going to hell and I'm going to fix you and turn on your lights, but that we together, by engaging with one another, are going to brighten our lights. Does that make sense? Yes. 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 Uh -huh. So to me, I find this model way more interesting. I find it way less judgmental. I find it way more open and exciting. And it makes the possibility for me to say to my church, like, hey, we need to be active in evangelism and discipleship, way less scary. Because all of a sudden, evangelism and discipleship means loving the people around me, listening to them, being my authentic self and sharing my authentic self with them in a way, like it just opens up the world of it's no longer the vision of like me standing on a street corner with a sign that says repent right? <laughs> and it, it becomes we much more of a... <laughs> sorry joan we have that in the land so we know okay. that. yeah i just i don't want to do that that doesn't sound fun you know i um but there are other ways in which okay how can i how can i shine my light how can i share what i know how can i engage with and 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 can I not spend so much time figuring out who the thems are, right? And who are the people that I really need to fix the most? Um, or who are the people that I've got a shot at fixing so that I can get more points? And I can instead say, hey, everybody, even my pastor, I'm going to evangelize him, right? <laughs> By brightening his life, or, you know, or, or her. I don't know um, what gender your pastor is. Okay, so uh, conversations, thoughts on on that model and, and just kind of, cause that's, I kind of want to start with the big idea. If you walk away with one thing, I want you to walk away with that. And so let's not bury the lead. Let me give you the content. Uh, and then I'll, I'll start breaking it down into little, some more practical nuggets. Okay. I think that I, I kind of always felt as evangelism being not just reaching out to people that don't know about Christ, but reaching out to people who, who do know that Christ exists, but they don't live a Christian life. Mm. You know, now our team at, church, at our church is called um, Evangelism and Outreach. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if maybe we need to uh, update the, the name of it to Evangelism and Discipleship, because that's really more descriptive of what, of what it should be, I think. Yeah. Well, that's more of what we do anyway. <laughs> yeah, it can, it might be just a matter of semantics, but. Uh, uh, yeah. Some churches have, oh, sorry, go ahead. You, discussion well, is good. Say, more say, um, my background in evangelism was young life. And to some extent, what you said is what we did. I mean, they still do. I, I don't mm -hmm. anymore, but. Uh, but was to reach out to the, the kids who were at high school, no matter what their situation. You had a mix. You had a mix of people who, kids who went to church, kids who didn't go to church, kids who were Christians, kids who weren't Christians, kids who didn't know what they were. <laughs> and uh, then you try to, you know, through befriending them, you know, and, and letting them know that you were there for them, that they would then come to see Jesus in you, in me, and then want to move into a close, you know, a relationship with Jesus and a, uh, a you know, and then having Bible studies together and but always encouraging them to go back to where, if they left a church or if they were in a church to go there and, you know, worship. But, um, you know, that's kind of my model. Yeah, I, I would, I would call that this model here. Um, that's I, pretty I was close. Wondering. Although I think that it kind of, it it, it was kind of a morphing. Uh, there wasn't, you know, I mean, certainly there was a conversion experience many times at a camp, say, yeah, uh, 
or just any time. But mm -hmm. a lot of times it was a very, uh, it's much more, uh, uh, I want to say, what do I want to say, organic as opposed to a, you know, like a Damascus Road experience. It's like just a movement towards Christ. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, and, and a movement, yeah, towards towards Christ on the back end. I I think this model here on the screen, it's it's a pretty good model. Um, and I I was on InterVarsity staff for several years. Um, we okay. worked closely with Young Life. I was never um, yeah. on Young Life staff, but yeah, but yeah, there there's that hope of, um, you know, how how many decisions did we get on decision night at the camp? Um, yeah, I never worried much about that, but but yeah, they were certainly. Yeah. Uh, a desire to see a lot of kids, you know, come and, to Christ. Yeah. And, and to be honest with you, I think that's probably healthier than um, some of the more reformed Christian circles and Christian ministries that don't don't seem to care about that. Um, <laughs> well, once you're baptized, you know, eh, whatever. Uh, right. Or, or, or we <laughs> once you're saved. We're going to spend our time <laughs> preaching to the choir. I mean, we can get a lot of really toxic kind of yeah. excuses if we're uncomfortable with the idea of evangelizing to just spend our oh i don't want to spend time with those people because they're unsafe they're not the right kind of people I, you know we can we can do all sorts of games to not be involved in no no i actually do want to I, I want this arrow to point this way and we want to see progress um and it uh, it matters to me that that, that happens uh and so yeah, so so let's tell stories and and point out real important moments al along that process, so that we know we're doing it, so that we know we're making you know. Uh, so in a, in a lot of ways, that I I, I don't want to trash this model at all. In fact, I think it's much more evolved than you know a lot of other models. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I I do think this is a, a step past it. Um, I I also um, think. Uh, well, I mean, in my I, church, can I make we another have... comment. Oh, can I make please? A... Okay, so my experience in working yeah. with kids in the church, yeah, it, many times they, even though they grew up, maybe they grew up there, they don't really understand what their, you know, what their relationship with God is, and yeah. and. So, so even in our little church, we have a mix of people who, who are, you know, coming with friends who don't know Christ or may, you don't know, and then you got ones who are very strong Christians, and then you got some who are questioning, and you know, so you got a whole mix there. And so I don't try to distinguish between them. I just try to share, you know, what I believe with them and what you know what the Bible says and. And that's kind of my model. Yeah, it's it connected to what Patty said. Um, you know, I in Kansas, I I met just a ton of people. I mean, everybody's Christian in Kansas. That's just it's just default. You know, it's um, well, oh, who created the world? I don't know, God. But that doesn't mean anything about how I'm living my life or what I'm doing or or e even how I think of God. Like, who is God? Well, I don't know, and I don't care. <laughs> and so there's plenty, um, plenty of progress to be made from that point on, um, and uh, yeah, and 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 in all of us, I mean, I, I, all all of us have pieces where we need to grow and we need to change, and we, you know, our both our our theology, our our thinking about God needs to improve, and also our hearts, and also our lives, um, and and yeah, this arrow. This evangelism discipleship arrow can happen in all of it. Now, that's not to say that we never, you know, make a distinction between, hey, this is this is a fun hot dog night where we're inviting the neighbors and there's nothing scary about it. And it's just something that's attractive to everybody, even people who've never had any exposure to church. And hey, this is a Bible study and we're going to tear apart the book of Leviticus. Uh, <laughs> and that is going to be scary, but some people want to go deep. Um, you can make those differentiations, but recognize that all of those moves, everything we're trying to do is about just bringing people closer and closer to Jesus Christ. Um, 
let me go to what what I find, like once we kind of get this big idea, once we're swimming in this water and we sort of cleanse our palate from the the sign guy idea of evangelism, I find this model really helpful. These are the five thresholds. Um, and I'm cribbing off of a book called I Once Was Lost by uh, Don Everts and uh, somebody Shaup. I think it's Doug Shaup, Doug and Don, yeah. Um, but so the question becomes, okay, now I'm, now I'm postmodern. Now I'm, I'm swimming in a big bog of, of amorphous whatevers. Um, what do I do? Like, what if I want to get busy? How, what's, what's step one? What, what can I, what can I say? How do I talk? Because I, I no longer want to say, well, now, you know, if you, if you died tonight, are you, are you sure that you would be in heaven? Because I don't believe salvation is all about heaven and hell. You know, salvation is about following Jesus and heaven and hell is a, a part of it. But life with Christ is the important thing. And and it entirely depends on where you are. You know, um, many people are going to respond to that question. Well, I don't believe in hell. So so what else can I do? And, and what's helpful? What will make me better at having these conversations? I think this model is really helpful. Um, it basically says that along the way to becoming a fully committed follower of Christ Jesus, there are five recognizable kind of moments or gates that you pass through. And it can, and the conversation can change depending on what gate a person is in. Um, so uh, does that make sense so far? Yes. All right. So let's let's open the first gate, if we will. Talking about moving from distrust to trust. The people who are farthest from God, the people who are least interested in ever coming to one of your church events, are the people who do not trust a single Christian. They just they think of Christians as homophobic, um, uh, backwards, uneducated, anti-evolutionist, um, gun-toting rednecks. Um, they just have like bad associations with, with Christianity. Um, and that's probably what you got a lot of in Kansas, right? <laughs> <laughs> we did not get a lot of that in Kansas, no. <laughs> um, well, although we did get some of those people, we did we did get some people who justified those stereotypes. <laughs> I would like to say something. Yeah, that's what I meant. There's a lot here. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and so, so the best evangelism process when when you meet someone and you say, "Man, it seems to me this is a first threshold person." Did, did any of y'all know any first threshold people in your lives? Any any distrust I, people? I do, I do. Uh, Andy and I owned a hardware store in Pennsylvania, and we mm -hmm. knew everybody in town, and we had access each and every day to many, many people. We had one young man who was a salesman that came into the store, and he had all kinds of junk to sell. But I did not treat him as though that this was junk. Um, I tried to have him trust that I what I had to say was in his better behalf and not so much for myself. And I think that people feel that, see that, and that's where the word trust comes to life. And after that, he came in many times, and each time I would have something to tell him to do about becoming a better salesman, a better person. And each time he would come in, he would say, I remember what you told me about my dress. I told him he had to wear better, you know, look a little more appropriate. And he had very, very bad complexion. Mm. And I said, what I would like for you to do for me, for the next time you come to see me, you have improved each time, but I have one more thing I really want you to do. He says, what's that? I said, I want you to shave your face, shave it close. And he came in the next time and his face had cleared up just by shaving. And I said, you know who did that for you? And I said, God, 
God was with you each and every time I met with you. And I came this emotional with him as I am telling you the story. And in that, I felt that young man found God. And you have to show a sincere, a very heart sincerity to the person you're trying to bring into God's fold. You can't just go out there and not have a connection or a trust built or a caring thought. These are all things that are necessary to start out as an evangelist. Thank you for sharing that. That's wonderful. I, uh, I, I think, uh, I, 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 again, uh, building trust. So, so the example of uh, somebody's coming into my store and I'm going to give a little bit at a time. And each time, you know, it, it's uh, each time I serve something, if they're eating it, then I can serve a little more and a little more. And yeah, that's a, that's just a brilliant model of what what someone needs when they're when they're distrustful to build trust and it sounds like you built a tremendous amount of trust with this person that he really looked to you um, as a mentor and as something of a mother um, for you to be able to share that with him and the other part of that is that we're always being watched and scrutinized to how we're living our lives mm -hmm. and you've got to walk straight and narrow Especially that's right yeah you do that's right they're always observing and wondering you know when you're going to slip up yeah one of the <clears throat> one of the worst things you can do if you want to move a first threshold person to a second threshold is uh have like a, a high pressure sales conversation with them right where you say turn or burn right now make a decision because i am only friends with you because i want you to become a christian no. like that that's going to make them that's going to confirm every wrong idea they have about christianity um, and, and some of the best stuff you can do is live your life according to the precepts that, that Christ has taught us to be a holy and righteous person. Now, that's going to change. When we get to, to threshold five, there's actually going to be important time to open your mouth and say, hey, you need to make a decision here, and I want to invite you to decide. But you have to know what threshold you're in. You have to pay enough attention to the person you're talking to to know when to open your mouth and, and when to when to live your life um, and, to, and to build and develop trust. Um, I've got a discussion. So why is it that people don't automatically trust Christians today? You know, it used to be back in the day, we didn't worry about this stuff. Back in the 50s, um, you say, I'm a Christian. They say, oh, okay. Um, but why is that not true anymore? I think part of it is that people have an idea that um, that Christians are very judgmental and that they want to bring you in their church because they want your money. And um, there's a sort of a lack of sincerity is um, is kind of. Yeah, there's a, there's a sense of bait and switch, right? If you've heard that. Uh, accusation yeah i think that they think that you're more interested in building up your numbers and building up your bank account than you are in in helping them and in a lot of cases i don't think that's true but i think that that's the perception of a lot of people that have not been truly involved with the church that are just kind of looking at them from the outside in mm -hmm. well and and i'll say this because because i think i think you're right i don't think it's true of all of us but i think that that stereotype was developed for a reason. And I, I think that is true for some of us. For some Christians, there's a sense of, oh no, the church is smaller than it used to be. We don't have as much money as we used to have. You know what we need? We need to get some more young Christians to fill up our numbers and, and pad, our, pad our budget. And that way we'll keep doing what we wanna do. And, and it's not motivated out of a pure heart of, uh, how can we serve these people? It's motivated out of a, how can we get served? What do we need from these people? Um, again, speaking as a millennial, I've, I've walked into a number of churches and, and felt the, the jump on, you know, the, oh, we need you, right? Young blood. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, it's a turnoff. <laughs> 
It's kind of like going into the car dealership and my four salesmen swarm on you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I think there's there's probably a lot of reasons, but to some extent, the merging of Christianity with politics has been a problem because now if, you know, if a person is, say, more on the liberal side, mm -hmm. well, all they see is the, the evangelical supporting somebody that they don't like and don't understand why they would support him if they believe what they said they believe. So I think that's a problem, too. That's even a problem for me. But, <laughs> but anyway, um, but then there's, you know, the, the, it gets fuzzy. Mm -hmm. Do you have to, well, it's almost like, remember back when, if you watched the movie Hawaii, you know, you, you have the missionaries coming in and say, well, if you want to be a Christian, you have to dress like this, act like this, you know, be like this. You can't be any other way. And so that's a turnoff. And yeah. you know, it's like, it's like you have to give up your culture in order to become Christian. And that's, that's, not true, number one, and number two, uh, it's it's put it's it's off putting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean so that is to say they don't need to do some things differently, but, but they right. don't have to give up their whole being, you know, mm -hmm. and, and belief system of everything in order to become a Christian. Because a lot of times they we pile on, Christians pile on all these cultural things onto their faith yeah so I, so a lot of times these threshold one people you know it's not um it's not that they're just skeptical doubting people you know it's uh, often they've been really badly hurt yeah. um and if you you spend some time building trust they they've run into some of those hawaii type missionaries right maybe their parents were those kind of hawaii type missionaries you know who said hey if you you know um, if, if you're not finishing your plate every night and, you know, then I'm going to force it down your throat because of Jesus. And <laughs> you, you, you start asking questions and they start revealing these things. Oh, it's, it's not, it's not you, it's your experiences. And yeah, I, you know, I, I have often said, you know, if I, if I had church experiences like yours, I don't think I'd want to be back in church either. Oh, wow. Um, and and sometimes be having a Christian be able to say that, right? And and say, mm -hmm. oh, really? I, I thought all Christians just loved all churches. Well, no. Some 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 Christians are really hurtful to people, or, or some people who profess to be serving Christ are really hurtful to people. And and it's a bad thing. And I, I want to invite you into something very, very different from that. Um let's move on to the next threshold. Um yeah, let's let's I, I think we've talked a, a good amount. I think, uh, I, I'm sorry, Miss Murray, you said your name was Jexy? Yes. You, yes. I, I think uh, this second question, how do you build trust with people? I think you gave a great example of how to do that. So we'll just move on because that's, Thank you. you know, just bit by bit, right? What What are you invite? how much of your life are am I invited into? And then how do I respect your boundaries? And as your boundaries expand, how do I continue to, um, to accept your invitations to be involved in your life and to, um, yeah, to, to, to build trust, to respect what you, the authority you give me and not more. Let's talk about indifference. Second threshold. So, so somebody trusts a Christian, right? They get past this distrust or this dislike of Christianity. The next problem you often going to run into is, um, is, is the, well, but it doesn't matter. You know, people believe all sorts of different things. There's a million religions in the world. The religion you believe in, it probably depends on where you were born. Um, the only reason you're a Christian is because you were born in the United States. Most people are Christians here. You'd believe something else if you were lived somewhere else. And so some Christians are nice. Some Christians aren't nice. Some Hindus are nice. Some Hindus aren't nice. We can never know the truth. I don't really care. Does it even really matter? Um, anybody know anybody like that? I would say I know a lot of people like that, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah it sounds we familiar. Had, we had uh, many times have we had the occasion to be with people who were indifferent 
Mm -hmm. And you, one of your first things you have to do with a person who is indifferent is not jam or say anything about your religion. Ask them how they feel about a religion. What is your thinking about the Bible? How do you feel? And then if they say, well, this is the way I feel, then they're going to ask you how you feel. And in doing that, you're slowly again getting into their psyche. And that's a very important thing for them to be able to open up to you. And that's the, all, the first step is to take away the indifference and make them feel that you care what they think. And you're not saying you're wrong. You're saying, yes, but I have a different way of thinking about it. And this is God's way. But you know, sometimes you can't even say God's way because that turns them off. You have yeah. to be very careful what you have to say and how you present it in order to get, you, you want to have one, two, three, four encounters or more before they're even going to start to come in and that back to the word trust. They're not going to trust you right away. I, uh, I had a math teacher whose name was Mr. Keefe. Um, I liked him. I hated math, but I, he was a good teacher. Um, and I remember he used to have us solve math problems on the board. And often, because we're high school kids, um, when somebody put a, a math problem on the board and they got the answer wrong, you know, somebody would be like, that's not right, that's wrong. And he would always say, hey, we don't say that's wrong. What do we say? We say, I got something different. <laughs> um, they were wrong, right? Math is a... <laughs> It's an objective. It's a finite. There, there is such a thing as right and wrong, but there, there's just a nicer way to say it, right? I got something different. Here's how I think about it. I think another thing that's um, that's really great about what you said, um, Jexy, is uh, that it um, when you ask someone about what they believe, they realize they believe things, right? <laughs> it, it causes them to. Um, to start to formulate a theology, and it doesn't have to be a Christian theology, but just to say, oh, well, I guess, yeah, there's there's right and wrong, or there's a purpose for things, or there's a, and, and they start to then figure out that they've got holes in their theology, right, where they start to say, and I'm not really sure how this works, you know, um, yeah, that's great, and, and so, so when they realize that they have a theology, and they start realizing they have holes, then there's, more opportunity to discuss, more curiosity. I think if you show an, you know, if you show an interest in what, what they believe in, then, then you're able to discern what their objections are and deal with their objections too. So mm -hmm. kind of opens that door to, to see what, what it is they don't like about Christianity or what they, what they think makes it not a good match for them because um, you showed interest in, in what they believe in, and you should have interest in what they believe in if you want them to be interested in what you believe in. It should be a mutual exchange. That's right. <laughs> we I, we uh, are also not only living in a postmodern world, we're living in a post-truth world. Mm. There is no truth. There's only opinion. It, and you see that everywhere. You know, I mean, the mm -hmm. fake news, the drumbeat, the, you know, Who's right? You're right for you. I'm right for me. You know, it, you see that a lot. Yeah. I, I, I want to mention on this threshold of curiosity, one of, I think, our greatest tools, one of our greatest advantages when we deal with wanting to make people curious about Christianity is Jesus. Um, Jesus is fascinating. And, and makes everyone curious all the time. I mean, he's just a really interesting guy and i don't care if you well i i ultimately do care but for the purposes of him being interesting it doesn't matter whether you believe he he really existed whether he's a historical character whether he's the son of god or not you can be curious and interested in him while believing none of those things um just because he's and many many people say well i don't believe anything that the church teaches about jesus but i think that jesus whoever he was he was a real good guy <laughs> and I, I want to learn more about what he has to say. Um, and it's just a great, uh, great opportunity. But I also think, again, going back to 
the fact that we Christians need evangelism. I think Jesus has some interesting things to say to us. And one of them is, is rooted in this question here. Um, Jesus brought curiosity out of people, out of indifferent people by asking questions. Um, why, why do we like answers so much? What's, what's our attraction to answers? To search for the meaning of life. <laughs> yeah, we don't like uh, to be up in the air about things. We don't like to be uncertain. Like, we, don't like, we don't like to be wrong. We always want to be right when we mm. answer questions. Yeah. And I, I do want to clarify, I'm not saying there are no right answers, right? Mm -hmm. What? What model of car do I drive? I drive a Dodge Ram. That is the right answer. If you tell me it's a it's a Ford Taurus, that's wrong. But what's more interesting, <laughs> right? What and and can we not have a better discussion than what model car do I drive, right? Maybe, maybe we can ask a more interesting question like, what do I like about the car that I drive? Um, how can you stoke people's curiosity? Do we have any more comments on this? What do you what do you do to make people curious? What are some things you've done? I think if you ask questions, it makes them curious. It gets them thinking. Mm -hmm. And if you yeah. present present ideas of your own and ask them what they think about it, I mean, just any way that you can to engage in a conversation as opposed to to uh, preaching a, a sermon to them, kind of thing. People love to be listened to. They love to be listened to. Right. Um, yeah. There's there's this guy. Well, I, uh, I, go go I ahead. Think that the way, <laughs> excuse me, the way you live out your life in general will make yes. people serious if you do things differently than they expected, right? You know, so you don't condemn me because I'm not a, a Christian or I'm going to church. Why is that? Why are you different? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, there's a, I, I forget the name of the preacher, but he goes around on national tours. Um, and one of his big like takeaways is this, you know, there's, there's two kinds of people who do evangelism in the Bible, right? There's the people who have this gift of evangelism and their job is to go around into Roman courts and sit with governors and kings and shove their foot indoors and, and talk to people who don't want to talk to them about Jesus. Um, and then there's everybody else. And, and so we need to pray for the people who have this gift who go and do that, um, that they will be strong in the face of persecution. And when they're put to death, they won't <laughs> relent, you know, and then they'll, they'll, they'll be bold. And then for the rest of us, what we need is um, to be ready always when people question us. Um, and so, but, but all of us need to be ready for that. All of us need to expect people to question us. And so if we're living, if we're following Jesus the right way, what that means is that following Jesus the right way implies we're living questionable lives, right? We're, we're living the kind of lives that people are going to say, you're weird, what's up with that? Um, so, that so that we can answer them, so, so, that, we, so that we have those opportunities. Um, and if we're not, if we're worried about the same things they're worried about, if we are hoarding up the same things they're hoarding up, if we're um, working for the same goals they're working for, um, and, and they're just gonna be like, eh, doesn't seem like it matters. Seems like it's a matter of like, what you do on the weekend for an hour, and I don't know, you could do whatever you want. It's flavors of ice cream. <clears throat> Let's talk about this. Close to change, open to change. Have you heard that, that famous uh, quote from St. Augustine? He, he prayed, Lord God, make me a Christian, but not yet. Sometimes you, you meet people who are, they, they're curious about Christianity. They're, they're interested in it, um, but they're, they're just not ready to, uh, to, to move, to change the way they've been living, to change the way they've been thinking. Um, I, 
have you have you been on Facebook? Have you noticed how how many people change their minds on Facebook? <laughs> it doesn't happen very much, right? Um, when when we have a belief, our brains are hardwired to maintain that belief, unless we we can't anymore, un unless great force acts upon it to change it. Um, so how how do we open people up to change? Let's talk about this question. You think this is true? I think that a lot of people are not comfortable with prayer, especially with the group prayer. They might, you know, say that they pray to themselves, but if you say, you know, do you want me to pray with you, that it creates an uncomfortable situation. Um, I know I have I have friends that that are, are nice people, but they're not Christian at all, and and um, I always find that it's sort of a step if if we're out to, to dinner or at their house for dinner, and they say. Well, you say grace because I know that they don't normally do it, but you know, they just it's just like a little baby step that they take. But I don't know, people, people, um, I don't know if they're embarrassed or, or what, but they, um, they just seem to, to resist praying in groups or out loud. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true even for a lot of Christians, right? Or a lot of, of self-identified Christians. I sometimes use the phrase nominal Christians, Christians in name. Mm -hmm. um, that they'll say, well, I have a personal private faith, um, but I don't want to share it with anybody else or even really want anybody else to notice. I just want that to be my thing between me and God. Um, I don't know. I don't know why that is, but I, I, mm -hmm. I notice it a lot. I mean, I, I do think there's some some baggage around prayer in general, right? Like like as a Christian subculture, we in in some ways deal are dealing with some false beliefs that like to be a good prayer is to be able to pray in the King James English and to have lots of articulate things to say. And you know, we just need to to untangle some of those bad examples. <laughs> um, <clears throat> How do you encourage people to be more open? How do, you, how do you encourage people to be willing to change their minds about anything? Making it seem simple to them, making it seem on their level. This is easy. You don't have to be elaborate and say a lot of, just say, thank you, God, for the food. And thank you for the people around the table. And just make it simple and meaningful. And that's the way you build a prayer, by starting out with just, and sometimes what we like to do is go around the table and have each person say something in the prayer. Be thankful for something. Tell us what you're thankful for, how you feel. And you've got to open them up and then they have to start to feel a little more comfortable about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the way you have to do it. Like we've saying baby steps. That's the way to do it. You've got to get each person to say one line, and that has a big accomplishment because they are serving your God and at their heads bowed and talking to him. And that is, to me, a big first step. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that the main thing is to not be judgmental, to mm. let them express themselves, say what they think, say what they believe, Maybe ask a question, but don't say, "Oh no, that's not right." Yeah, you know, right. I'm, I've got all the answers. You don't have them. You've got to, <laughs> you've got to say, "Well, that's you know, that's an interesting point of view. Tell me a little bit more about it, and let's discuss it. And then maybe they'll let you share what you think." Yeah. Yeah, I, I when people are likely to change in small ways at first. And, and it's, it's one of those moments that's a real easy time to go back a couple thresholds because if they, if they change their mind about something and they're like, well, maybe, maybe prayer is cool sometimes. And you say, aha, then that's a real easy way to go back to this distrust threshold, right? <laughs> um, gotcha. Um, it's, it's much better to, yeah, just be like, yeah. I, I also think modeling our openness 
and modeling our willingness to change and to, to see new information, um, both about Christianity and, and other things, um, to just say, you know, I didn't think I liked calamari, but this is pretty good. It just gives room and it, it helps to model and it helps to make safe space for people. Um, yeah, so, so helping people. Uh, and speaking of safe space, I think recognizing that this is like a fifth of the process, right? The, the difference between I, I like this and I like this enough to actually change for it. Um, it, it takes some time. It takes some getting used to. Um, and so it just helps to kind of kind of count it. <laughs> um, uh, because because otherwise we can be like, all right, I've, I've convinced you, you're curious. I've, I've convinced you Jesus is cool. So you're ready? And no, not, not yet. No, I'm not. <laughs> um, I've got, and I don't know why I'm not. I don't have a good answer for you. I just am not. <laughs> Wandering to seeking. Anybody know what I mean by this? Should I talk a little more about it? Yeah, that'd be good. Okay, so so oftentimes people people get to a place in their spiritual journey, they realize that what they believe doesn't make sense to them, that they realize that they have a theology, they're curious about Jesus, they're curious about truth, they they want more truth. Um, but they, uh, they're, they're aimless. So, so they're, they're interested. Um, they're, they're ready to adopt a new worldview, to adopt a new way of life. Um, but they just don't know which direction to turn. And so they, they, this is the eat, pray, love threshold, right? <laughs> the, I'm just going to wander through India and I'm just going to talk to lots of interesting people, and I don't really know what's up. I feel like if I was going to make a decision about one religion, I need to read 500 books about all of the different religions so that I can make a fully informed choice. And I don't like to read, so I haven't read any books. <laughs> and what we need to do is we need to get people to a place of seeking, uh, to, to a place of, of looking for God. Um, so they're not just okay, I've walked away from what I used to have, and now I'm not walking towards anything in particular to say, I'm, I'm going to follow the light that is Jesus, wherever that leads. Um, how, do we, how do we get to that place? Well, it kind of sounds like this is a point in time where you should be encouraging them to maybe uh, att attend a worship service or join a Bible study or, or some way that would give them some direction. Or maybe even if they're not comfortable with that physical presence in a church, give them a book that might, you know, direct them in a, in a, into living a more Christian life or, or seeking Christ more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're getting close now. Well, I think, yeah, I think that you have to be not eager and anxious because, you know, because they're starting to ask the questions that you think is going to lead them to the right place, but just to continue to interact with them, mm -hmm. encourage them in their, you know, in the, encourage them in their seeking and let them know that you're there for them whenever they need you for whatever it is, because it isn't a, normally, uh, my experience is not normally, like say, the Damascus Road experience for somebody. It's usually a gradual coming to a realization that do you feel, they want. Yep. Do you feel they might be afraid? And that they have a fear in their heart? I, uh, I think that can certainly happen. I think if that's happening, if they're, if they're wandering because they're afraid, I would almost count that as third threshold. I would say what's really going on is you're pretending to wander, but you're really not open to change. True. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and so what we need to do there is to, to cultivate openness. Um, but there's mm -hmm. also, oftentimes there's just sincere aimlessness, right? Like, I, no, I really have no idea. Does somebody have an idea? I wish anybody had an idea. <laughs> um, 
I so I think I think books. Well, are if they're here. there, yeah. if they're there, then certainly <laughs> yeah. you can share. At that point, share. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I, I have an idea. I, I have a relationship with a guy named Jesus Christ, and and you can too. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> if you would like to, and yeah. you know, it's it's really not that complicated any more than it is to meet a new person. You know, you just you know you mm -hmm. you are open. To meeting them yeah and and i think um i think there's an important difference here between um uh, in, inviting them to investigate jesus specifically right inviting them to to look into jesus and saying here here are some other people you can talk to here here's a church you can go to here's here's a book you can read here's more information i can share with you to help you in your search and and to notice that like hey listen if you take this bible that i'm giving you and you decide to read a few chapters that doesn't mean you're committed right you don't have to sign your name in blood <laughs> it's it's okay to, to look and to, to to see if there's something compelling that you want to look more into about this um so i think how, that Excuse me. I think that this is a good time when we could have guided Bible readings that, that devotionals daily or like for Lent. Sometimes we have Lenten studies and, and guide and pass out little booklets so that they can have a day to day following. Because if they they're so insecure and want to hit, become a Christian, if they don't know how to do it, you, this is one way to show them that this is a guide that you can use. That's right. That's right. In in IV, we used to have things called gigs, groups investigating God. And so it'd usually be a very small group, like maybe three people. You know, there'd be like a, 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 a student leader and like an apprentice student leader, somebody learning how to do gigs, and then somebody who's not sure what they think about God. And then we'd be like, all right, let's open up the Bible. John chapter two, this is where God uh, sees they ran out of alcohol and made more. Uh, what, do you, <laughs> what do you think? You know, um, it just, it opens up this, uh, yeah, the, the, it, this opportunity to kind of, to, to seek. I, I also, I love this question here on the PowerPoint because really our goal is, is to clarify the quest, right? So to say, all right, I'm wandering, I'm, I'm open to change. I'm looking for something new. I don't know where to start um, to ask, well, you don't know where to start to do what? You don't, what are you, what are you looking for? You know, are you looking for a way to live? Are you, are you looking for more moral foundations? Are you looking for truth? Um, let's, let's figure out, let's not just collect every, everything that looks good to embroider on a pillow, but let's, let's figure out what we're really trying to do here. And then, yeah, you know, it, I've got some thoughts. You can eat the meat and spit out the bones, but let's, yeah, let's keep working. Let's not just pat ourselves on the back because we're so open-minded now. I'm, I'm glad you're open-minded. We had to work to get you open-minded, right? Or maybe I, I entered the conversation, you were already open-minded. But now let's not be so open-minded that our brains fall out. I think and then here's, I think, sorry, go ahead. I think in, in a sense, it kind of goes back to the, the idea that the best sermon is a good example. So if they're mm -hmm. open to a way of life and they see the joy of Christ in you and how you live your life, then your example might be um, a good way to lead them on their quest. I, uh, I, th I think that's true. And I think that's especially true for the first three thresholds. Um, as we get to this last threshold now, the fifth threshold, um, this is where, I told you I was going to say this, this is where it, it comes time to say something. Um, are you ready to follow Jesus? You know, that, that old saying, St. Francis of Assisi never actually said it, but it's accredited to him. Um, preach the gospel at all times, but when necessary, use words. Okay, inside that saying contains the truth, the reality that you need to use words when it is necessary, and that sometimes it is necessary to use words. Um, so there, there comes a time to say, "Do you want to? Do you want to follow Jesus? Are, 
are, are you a Christian? Are you, are, you ready to, are you ready to give your life to Jesus Christ? Because he wants your whole life, by the way. This isn't like, a, like an ideological thing. This is like a entering into a community of faith. This is a commitment. This is a, a, a heart allegiance. Um, is that where you are? Because if it is, I'm excited about that. And, and I can, and, and, and this, by the way, this thing, this is the easy part. It's, it is the easy, easy part. The, when, when someone is ready and, and they're curious and they're open and they're seeking and they trust you, then at that point, if you like fumble over words and you're not sure what to say, and you say, uh, I don't have a diagram, I forgot the diagram, something about a cross, Jesus is good, that'll work. That, like, that won't ruin it. <laughs> That's okay. Um, because, because they already trust you and they're already seeking and they're already open and they're just like, what? Should we Google the diagram? Like, they'll, they'll help you at that point. Well, I, I think also this is this is where we can we we need to trust that the yeah. one who's really calling them mm -hmm. is Jesus and the whole through the Holy Spirit. We just happen to be the vehicle by which they are using to help move this person to. Them. But it's them, not me. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, and, I don't and have to be about, all sweaty about it, right? I can, I can <laughs> relax. <laughs> yeah. No, nothing about how well prepared our sales pitch is at this point is gonna, is gonna make them go to heaven or hell, right? That's that's not what it's about. Um, good reformed theology says that God has already known them from from the beginning of time. Um, they they are foreknown and predestined, and so all we are doing is being faithful to our divinely instructed mission, which is to help people in their sojourning. It's, it's to help people get to where they already are called to be, where God created them to be in life. And so, um, so, so many, so many uh, like evangelism training programs spend the majority of the time on this. And, and they say, all right, we're going to work on our elevator speech. We're going to get everything ironed out and perfect for this moment. And like, well, good. I mean, I'm glad that you'll be ready to open your mouth at this moment because some people won't be. Some people will, will have heard the message, oh, preach the gospel at all times when necessary, use words so much. They will not dare to open their mouth lest they seem pushy, lest they seem too religious, you know, and we don't want to be those people. But if, if we open our mouth and we say, I, well, I, I mean, I, I, the, the last sermon I saw was on pride, and I think Jesus helps us defeat our pride. Do you want your pride to feed? Like, do we just focus on something weird and small? That's fine. That'll work. That'll, like, God can use that God, as long as we're inviting people, as long as we're saying, hey, it, are, are you ready? Are you, you seem ready to me. I've been, you know, I've been thinking about, like, where you are on your journey and, um, I, I've seen you make such good progress. I, are, are you, and, and maybe they will say, I, actually, no, I'm not ready. Um, cause I'm, I've, I've been wandering and I started seeking and I started realizing I'm not as willing to change as I thought I was. I've still got some like childhood trauma that I've got to deal with. Okay. Right. Not, not ready is not ready. Let's, let's continue to build trust. Let's continue to build openness. But if you are ready, let's do this thing. Right. <clears throat> Jesus loves to invite people to become his followers. Jesus isn't pushy, right? I don't think he's pushy. Any any thoughts on this, how you can grow as an inviter? All right. Then I, let's I, go. I, I think oh, it's go mostly ahead. just being it's mostly just being aware and ready when the opportunity is yeah. for itself. You know, it's like, again, I'm not the one who's, you know, I don't, I don't have a notch in my belt when a person becomes a Christian because it's not me. It's, it's God. And I'm yeah. a, I'm a, 
participant in this process. That not an unimportant participant, but just a participant. I'm not the one. I'm not the one. And so that's the way that I feel like I'm just ready when I hear somebody say something, usually somebody I've known for a while, uh, say something that indicates an interest or a curiosity that I can that I can move into with them and share what I believe or ask more questions about what they're saying. That's mm -hmm. just being aware, aware <clears throat> and, not, and not oblivious. I love it. I love it. Um, I, I will also say this, and this is this is my own like, uh, I don't know, I'm projecting a little bit because this is what I'm dealing with with my church. But uh, practicing inviting to other things helps with inviting to follow Christ, right? So if you if you can invite your Christian friends to the the midweek church potluck, and you can hear them say no, you know if if you can invite um, your non Christian friends out to lunch to just get to know each other better, and they can accept that invitation, it just builds it. It's like weight training; it just builds your muscles. Right. Just try inviting to to a bunch of things. Take some risks, um, and uh, and that'll help you be more ready when the time comes. I we are drawing to a close. Oh, go ahead. But just to say that showing interest in other people mm -hmm. is uh, the first step in becoming their friend, their trusted person. Mm -hmm. You must take an interest in what they're doing and their lives. They're not just going to want you to be with them if you don't care about them or have an interest in them. That's right. That's right. That's Dave Ramsey, right? The cultivate a sincere interest in other people because feigned interest doesn't work, right? Like I'm only pretending to be interested because I want to, I want something out of you. I want, I want to get your tithe money. That's the, they'd see right through that. Um, they feel that and they know that instantly. Immediately. Like yeah. Um, but yeah, no matter what you do, yeah, I, you, you could be moving away next month, but I'm, I'm interested in knowing you. I'm interested in hearing your story. Um, and I am, I'm interested in helping you. I'm, I'm interested in shining as much light as I have and seeing your light shined at me so that I, so that we can both progress. That's, that's what I'm about. That's, you know, yeah. I think it's important too that, that <laughs> make it clear that your interest is for them to be a follower of, of Jesus Christ, that, that the goal is not for them to, to necessarily become a, a member of your church or to be a contributor to, to your church or a worker at your church, that the ultimate goal is to spread, spread the word of Jesus Christ to everybody until everybody is heard. And that um, if another church is a better fit, then you know make it clear that that's where they should be going, that it's not about numbers, m ms what is it, numbers and money. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I think that also would help um, on the trust issue for, for Christian churches in general, not just not just your particular church or, or yourself. That's a good word. It's a good word. All right. Well, uh, we, we talked about how prayer can be scary, but is there is there somebody who feels who feels bold today who would like to close us in prayer? I'd be glad. I'm willing to do it. I'll, I'll do that. Heaven, <laughs> Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time to be together and learn about evangelism, to, to learn how to best spread the word of Jesus Christ to all those who don't know and to help deepen the faith and commitment of those who are follow or do know Jesus Christ and, and are professed to be Christians. We ask that you Help us as a church to be able to step out into our community and invite people to be Christians and to seek a closer journey to you in the walk with faith. And we ask that you send the Holy Spirit to guide us in, in our mission to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for taking the time. Thank you for inviting me to do this. I, uh, I hope it was helpful. William, did you have something else to say or was your hand just by the camera? Just saying thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Yeah, we did. We enjoyed it.